Guy Scouts, let's dive into our new unit, unit two for the lecture. I can wait too if you want to talk. Okie dokie. So unit two for the lecture. Um, it's going to focus primarily on the immune system and our respiratory systems. Um, we're going to spend, we're going to take a, a typical four credit undergraduate course and we're going to try to squeeze it into a single chapter in your A&P textbook. Um, some of you may have taken immunology, some of you may be undergraduate researchers in, um, in the immunology lab. You're going to really enjoy this chapter. Um, I'm not sure, but I know most microbiology classes also will have a unit dedicated to the immune system as well. So hopefully for a good chunk of you, there'll be some nice overlap between this unit and your microbiology class, not in wood. Um, let's dive in and start talking about our immune system. As we look at our immune system, guys, gals, um, a lot of times when we think of the immune system, we think of an, we call it, most people want to call it an organ system, but that's a little bit of a misnomer. And it's a misnomer because it doesn't necessarily have a lot of specific organs. The immune system is better described as a network of cells that travels between the organs of our body. And we can have immune cells in our digestive organs, our cardiovascular organs. Our immune cells can be spread out all over in the organs of other body systems. There is a very specific body system, though, that's going to be associated with the immune system, um, very tightly associated with the immune system, and that is the lymphatic system. I need to emphasize this to you. I'm going to repeat it a couple times. Our lymphatic system is going to remove excess fluids from the body. The lymphatic system is a network of organs that removes excess fluids from the body. And I'm saying that twice. I'm repeating it because I had an experience at the clinic two years ago, um, where the nurse had no idea what the, the lymphatic system was. And I was thinking to myself, good gravy, and you're my nurse. So I want to make sure you don't do that to your patients. Know that the lymphatic system is going to be involved with removing excess fluids from our bodies. And as we look at our lymphatic system, there are very specific organs associated with it. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize. There's a completely separate circulatory system in our bodies, separate from the blood vessels. And that's going to be the circulatory system of our lymphatic system. We have lymphatic vessels that circulate lymphatic fluid throughout our bodies. So here is the cardiovascular system, or the blood vessels overlaid with lymphatic capillaries. I love this diagram. This is a classic diagram. And as we look at this diagram, there's a couple key structures to focus on. First, as we look at our lymphatic blood vessels, and I'm going to go with purple. Let's see how purple turns up. Our lymphatic vessels typically start in a blood capillary bed. And if we think back to our last unit, blood capillaries are where lots of fluid will leak out of the cardiovascular system and enter the extracellular fluid or the interstitial fluid. Most of that liquid is going to be reabsorbed on the venous side of the blood capillaries due to the increase in hydrostatic pressure of the extracellular fluid relative to the hydrostatic pressure in the bloodstream. However, there's going to be some leftovers. We don't reabsorb all the liquid we lose from our bloodstream in our capillary beds. And that little, that smidgen, that fraction, approximately 15%-ish, depending on how hydrated we are, how much protein we have in our diet, that smaller fraction is going to be building up in the extracellular fluid. And occasionally, we'll have too much buildup in our extracellular fluid. Our lymphatic system can't keep up with removing the fluid buildup. That's when we get puffy and we're retaining water or fluids. You've probably experienced that at some point in your life. As we're looking at this process, the lymphatic capillaries that are shown on the screen are going to remove about two to four liters of fluid a day. Or in other words, another way to think of this is a half gallon to a gallon of liquid a day is going to be circulated by our lymphatic system and then dumped back into the bloodstream. Our lymphatic system does more than just fluid recovery, though. Our lymphatic system is intimately linked to the immune system. 
our lymphatic system functions primarily to help, or when we think of our immune system, it's the primary method of filtering antigens from our bodies, or filtering the pathogens from our extracellular fluid. So as bacteria or viruses, or maybe we'll have some small multicellular, multicellular parasites building up in our extracellular fluid, they'll get sucked up into the lymphatic system and concentrated in the lymphatic system for our immune cells to be exposed to. Um, within our lymphatic system, there's some filtering points. You can think of these filtering points as kind of like the drain in your sink. So for those of you who don't have a dishwasher at home, you have to wash dishes by hand at the sink. And you know, you have nasty sink waters, all those big chunks of stuff floating in it, but they're fairly dilute. Then when you pull the plug in the bottom, all the gross stuff gets filtered and concentrated at the, fil at the drain plug. And in the same token, we have bits of nastiness in our extracellular fluid pathogens, bacteria, viruses, et cetera, et cetera. Those bits of nastiness, those pathogens, get concentrated in our lymph nodes. I'm going to underline that for us. The lymph nodes are where those pathogens or antigens will be concentrated in our lymphatic system, and we have lymphatic, excuse me, we have immune cells waiting there monitoring the systems. Um, when I was in college, I was an opening lifeguard for the local pool at the YMCA. And one of my jobs was to clean the pool filter every morning. And, you know, when you look at a public pool that's chlorinated, the water looks pretty nice. But I guarantee you, when you look at the filter, it's not, it, it's, it revolutionizes your opinion of public pools. I still tr have trouble going into hot tubs to this day. Another thing that our lymphatic system does for us is going to be lipid absorption. And we're going to talk about this more in the digestive system. Um, we mentioned this briefly last semester when we talked about macromolecules. Um, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and amino acids in our small intestine are absorbed directly into the bloodstream within the microvilli of our small intestinal tract. However, lipids are hydrophobic. We have a hard time getting lipids into the bloodstream because they don't like being dissolved in water. Uh, in that case, to get around that problem, we're going to absorb lipids into our lymphatic system. And within our digestive tract, we have a small lymphatic capillary. I'm going to use green to make it a little bit easier for you to see. We have a small lymphatic capillary that extends up into each villi in the small intestine. And that small lymphatic capillary serves for lipid absorption in our digestive tract. So when we eat fat, we absorb the fat into our lymphatic system directly. Another way of looking at this is, when we think of the circulatory routes, those carbs, those amino acids, and those nucleic acids are sent through the hepatic portal system to the liver to be processed before they're sent to the heart. Our lipids bypass the hepatic portal system entirely. Ruby. That's an excellent question. The reason it's easier to absorb lipids into our lymphatic system as opposed to the bloodstream is because there are antipathic salts present within the lymphatic system, within that lipid. Um, antipathic salts are um, salts that will have either positive or negative regions, and there's also going to be a fair number of zwitter ions as well, or chemical compounds that have both polar and nonpolar regions. They act as a surfactant that allow you to emulsify the fats. Now, when we think of the lymph itself, that's the liquid that we recover from the, the extracellular fluid. When we think of the chemical composition of lymph and the chemical composition of extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid, they're nearly identical. The primary difference is going to be location, location, location. Extracellular fluid is outside of the cells and not in any tubes. But the moment we take that liquid and absorb it into the tubes of the lymphatic system, into those lymphatic vessels, we rename it lymph. Some textbooks refer to lymph as a tissue because there are cells associated with it. There's an extracellular matrix. Um, your current text doesn't really hammer that home. So for this round of teaching a and I'm not going to hammer lymph as a liquidy tissue. Um, we'll reserve that for blood, which nobody will argue with. Um, as we look at the lymphatic vessels, those are going to be the tubes that specifically transmit lymph. And our lymphatic vessels are going to mirror 
the venous side of our cardiovascular system. We're going to have smaller vessels merging to larger vessels, merging to continually larger and larger vessels. As we're going to larger and larger vessels, we'll have some filtering points. Those filtering points are going to be the lymph nodes. And eventually, all of this extra fluid, uh, this half gallon to one gallon of extra liquid we absorb into our lymphatic system, is going to be dumped into our bloodstream. And from our bloodstream, we ultimately get rid of it two ways, actually three, four ways. Um, the big one is urination. Urination, urination, urination. And when we get to the urinary system, we'll look at how we regulate blood fluid or fluid balances in our body by regulating urine production. Uh, for any of you that are maybe play a brass instrument in band, you know that you exhale quite a bit of moisture, which is why we need spit valves in our brass instruments. We also lose moisture through sweating, and we'll also lose moisture through defecation as well. But the big one is urination. As we look at the lymphatic organs, and lymphatic tissues. The tissues themselves are going to be an aggregate of cells that are associated with our lymphatic system. The two most common cell types are going to be our lymphocytes and our macrophages. And we'll talk more about those tissues in subsequent slides. Um, the same is going to be true for our lymphatic organs. When we think of lymphatic organs, they have a concentration of the cells of both the lymphatic and the immune systems. The key distinction that makes a lymphatic organ a lymphatic organ is the capsule of that organ. It's separated from the surrounding connective tissue by some epithelial tissues making up a capsule. So there is a distinct border that makes up the lymphatic organ. Let's talk about lymph in a little bit more detail. It's clear, it's colorless, it comes from the extracellular fluid. If we think back to the last unit, or just last week, extracellular fluid comes directly from the blood plasma. So when we think of lymph and how it comes from the extracellular fluid, the extracellular fluid comes from the blood plasma. The chemical composition of lymph is going to be very similar to the chemical composition of our blood plasma. The big difference between lymphatic fluid and our blood plasma is going to be protein content. Most of the proteins dissolved in our blood plasma can't exit the bloodstream to get into the extracellular fluid and consequently can't get into the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic fluid typically is going to have a lower co protein concentration relative to the blood plasma that originated that lymphatic fluid. Our lymphatic capillaries are nearly everywhere in the body. Um, Generally speaking, anywhere that has a blood capillary bed is going to have some lymphatic capillaries. So as a rule of thumb, if a tissue has a lot of blood vessels in it, that tissue is also going to have a lot of lymphatic vessels in it as well, as a general rule of thumb. There are some notable exceptions. For instance, both the cartilage and the cornea are tissues that don't have either blood vessels or lymphatic fluids. Recall the cornea is the clear coating on the anterior of our eye. Um, a particular tissue, though, that does not have lymphatic vessels but does have blood capillaries is going to be the bone and the bone marrow. So bone and bone marrow will have lots of blood supply. It's highly vascular, but won't have those lymphatic vessels in it. As we look at the wall of a lymphatic capillary, it's going to have some overlapping simple squamous epithelium or some flattened cells that are single layer thick. And because they overlap with each other ever so slightly, they form very weak one-way valves. This overlapping flap of these cells will cause liquid, let's go to red here, will cause liquid to flow from the extracellular cavity into our lymphatic vessels. To hold our lymphatic vessels in place, we have some proteins in the extracellular matrix, some filamentous proteins that will anchor them within the tissue itself. And those valve-like flaps help make it so that liquid can enter the lymphatic system but not exit the lymphatic capillaries. That's a key point of emphasis. Once lymphatic fluid enters those lymphatic capillaries, we primarily will have it exit the lymphatic system um, once it drains into the subclavian veins as the primary exit point. 
We're not going to lose those lymphatic or that lymphatic fluid from the capillaries back to the extracellular compartment. As we take those lymphatic capillaries, those lymphatic vessels will merge to form larger and larger tubes. Those larger and larger vessels will start to mimic the structure of a vein. When we look at the structure of these larger lymphatic vessels, they look very similar to the vein. Um, a common misconception that students have is that lymphatic vessels are green because, hey, every textbook colors them green. But just like veins are not blue in our bodies, lymphatic vessels are not green in our bodies. Arteries, veins, and lymphatic vessels are all about the same kind of buff or um, light tannish color in our bodies. Now, as we look at the structure of lymphatic vessels, lymphatic vessels are going to have one-way valves in them, just like our veins. Here's a photomicrograph of the one-way valve of a lymphatic vessel or inside of a lymphatic vessel. These one-way valves are going to be nearly identical to the one-way valves in our veins. So they have similar structure and similar function. So when we think of how the skeletal muscle pump moves blood through our veins, that skeletal muscle pump will do the same thing for our lymphatic vessels. Flexing and moving your skeletal muscles increases, excuse me, lymphatic circulation. It's going to rem improve the removal of fluid from the extracellular compartment. Or another way of thinking of it is, is if you're feeling bloated, a good way to not feel bloated is to move your body more and increase lymphatic circulation. Now, eventually, those larger lymphatic vessels will form lymphatic trunks, and then those lymphatic trunks are going to um, eventually drain into some major portions of our bodies. And as we continue merging, we'll also have some collecting ducts. Um, I'm going to star, circle, underline the collecting ducts. Make sure you commit these to memory. These are a big deal. They are also lab objectives as well. These collecting ducts are going to drain liquid from the lymphatic system directly into the venous side of our circulatory system. When we look at the right lymphatic duct, it drains into the right subclavian vein. When we look at the thoracic duct, it drains into the left subclavian vein. And I think this picture really does a much better job than the text on the previous slide. So when we look at the drainage on our bodies, we don't have symmetrical drainage in our bodies. Our subclavian veins are not symmetrical from the left to right sides, and we don't have sy symmetry with our drainage ducts or lymphatic ducts either. So as we look at the right side of the body, the right lymphatic duct will drain into the right subclavian vein and will drain this portion that's highlighted in green. So about, we'll say, one-fifth of the body is going to be drained by the right lymphatic duct. The left lymphatic duct, excuse me, the thoracic duct that drains into the left subclavian artery is going to be responsible for the rest of the drainage in the body. So in terms of the real estate they're responsible for, the thoracic duct is responsible for draining most of the lymphatic fluid back into the bloodstream. As we're moving this lymphatic fluid through our bodies, the contraction of the skeletal muscle tissue is one of the major or primary forces that will push the lymphatic fluid back into the circulatory or cardiovascular system. Now, as this fluid is flowing, it's going to be at very low pressure, and there'll be frequent lymph nodes that filter particles out of the lymphatic fluid, and eventually we'll go from very small lymphatic capillaries to larger lymphatic vessels to the collecting duct that drains directly into the subclavian vein, whether it's the left or the right subclavian vein. I think this is going to be the fourth time I've said it so far today. Skeletal muscle contraction primarily is going to be the force driving the movement of that lymphatic fluid through the lymphatic system. You've got to move your bodies to circulate the lymphatic fluid. But in addition to the skeletal muscle pump, <coughs> there's some other factors as well. I've already mentioned the vein or the valves within the lymphatic vessels. 
But some other things that help power the movement of lymphatic fluid are going to be arterial pulsation. These lymphatic vessels are right next to our arteries. So as our arteries expand out with, with left ventricular systole, the arteries will bulge, and the bulging of the artery squeezes the lymphatic vessel and helps to push the lymph through that lymphatic vessel. We also have a thoracic pump, which is when we inhale. As we inhale, our thoracic cavity increases in volume. The increase in volume causes a decrease in pressure. And think back to fluid flow. Fluids always flow from areas of high pressure to low pressure. So during inhalation, when we expand our thoracic cavity, we have slightly lower pressure in the thoracic cavity, and we have a slightly increased fluid flow into the thoracic cavity. Let's talk about some of the cells of our lymphatic system. Probably my favorite cell type is the natural killer cell, or the NK cell. Uh, initially, I was attracted to the cell type as a student just because the name was kind of cool sounding to me. Um, but the more I studied the immune system and the lymphatic system, the more I came to just truly appreciate everything that the natural killer cells do for us. If you're looking for a red hot area of research right now, um, that is going to be reprogramming natural killer cells to attack cancer cells in the human body. Um, right now, if you want to be a cancer researcher, you really need to be an immunologist. Um, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, um, there haven't been many major advances in those methods of treatment in the last several decades, but there's very rapid and promising development when it comes to reprogramming the cells of our immune system to destroy cancerous cells and leave the regular human cells alone. A big issue that we have with natural killer cells is that they are going to look at the cells in our body and destroy whatever does not belong there. They're kind of like the security guard or the bouncer. They're constantly going from cell to cell to cell, asking to check the identification. And if a cell can present a proper ID, the natural killer will leave it alone. But if the cell does not have a correct ID or shows some kind of an indication that it has quote unquote contraband, the natural killer cell is going to destroy it. Um, and this, to keep playing out the analogy, contraband could be viral infection. If that human cell is harboring a virus, the NK cell could potentially destroy it. If that human cell is harboring a mutation, that would cause it to reproduce uncontrollably, AKA precancerous mutation, the NK cell will destroy it. So these natural killer cells do a lot of good things for our bodies. Not only do they remove viral infections, they remove bacteria and they remove precancerous cells from our bodies. They're pretty cool. Um, when we talked about the blood cells, we had mentioned how there were five primary leukocytes, or five primary white blood cells. And the second most common white blood cell is the lymphocyte. During this chapter, this discussion, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about lymphocytes. There are many flavors, variations, and varieties of our lymphocytes. The two broad categories of lymphocytes are the T lymphocytes and the B lymphocytes. T lymphocytes are so called because they mature in the thymus. Thymus starts with a T. T cells or T lymphocytes come from the thymus. Mature T lymphocytes come from the thymus. B lymphocytes, um, um, and this is just a coincidence, come from the bone marrow. B for bone marrow, particularly the red bone marrow. Um, originally, B lymphocytes were isolated from the bursa of a chicken, which is how they got the name B lymphocyte, but we actually thought in human beings, get them from our red bone marrow. When we think of B lymphocytes, the best thing that we can do with our B lymphocytes is make antibodies. As our B lymphocytes will differentiate, they turn into a kind of cell known as a plasma cell, and that plasma cell is what produces the antibodies of our immune system. We also have a lot of macrophages in our immune system. When we think of a macrophage, I want you to think of the big eater. Macro for big, phage for eat. So these very large cells, some of the largest cells of our immune system, are going to come from the monocytes. Monocytes are the largest white blood cell of the five that we covered in the last unit. When a monocyte is activated, the monocyte turns into a macrophage. 
and this macrophage is going to specialize in phagocytizing or swallowing pathogens in our bodies. There are other macrophages, or excuse me, phagocytotically active cells, but the macrophage is the big one. Not only is it going to remove debris from our bodies, it's going to remove bacteria, it's going to remove dead human cells from our bodies, and can destroy and phagocytize larger pieces of foreign matter. As we look at our macrophages, um, they are also one of our many antigen-presenting cells. After a macrophage phagocytizes something, it will chop up that bacterium into little pieces and then take little pieces of the bacterium and decorate its cell membrane with those pieces of the bacterium and then show those pieces of the bacterium to other cells of the immune system to help initiate the immune response. We have other antigen-presenting cells in our body, including dendritic cells and um, some other cells that are associated with specific tissues. When we look at the dendritic cells, these dendritic cells are going to be associated with epithelial tissues. We have quite a few of them in our skin, particularly in the dermis and epidermis of our skin, but anywhere we have epithelial tissues, we're going to have lots of dendritic cells. These dendritic cells, much like the macrophages, are going to phagocytize antigens or pathogens and display the antigen of the pathogen on the cell membrane to help activate the immune system. Within our, oh, close that. Within our lymph nodes, we have a lot of reticular cells. And these reticular cells within our lymph nodes have a branched fibrous network that help contribute to the filtering capabilities of our lymph nodes or the stroma of our lymph nodes that filters the lymphatic fluid. So when we define what a lymphatic tissue is, it's anywhere where we have a concentration of lymphocytes associated with some of the various epithelial tissues. So if we have lots of lymphocytes, particularly within lymphatic uh, within mucous membranes, we're going to call that a lymphoid tissue. We have some lymphoid tissues that are spread out very diffusely throughout the body. These lymphoid tissues are primarily going to be associated with our mucous membranes and are going to be associated generally with anywhere in the body that has access to the exterior. So if we think of our GI tract, we have lots of pathogens, lots of antigens entering our mouth and exiting our anus. And because of that, we have lots of this diffuse lymphatic tissue lining our GI tract to help monitor what's getting into our bodies and having access to the inside of our bodies. Another part of our body that has exposed to the outside is the respiratory tract. And as we breathe in and breathe out, every breath typically is going to have a couple hundred to a couple thousand spores and bacterium going in and out of our respiratory tracts. And then also, within our general urinary tracts. So when we look at the urethra or the mucous membrane of the vulva in the female reproductive tract, there's going to be a lot of this lymphatic tissue, diffuse lymphatic tissue associated with it as well. As we look at lymphatic nodules within this area, this is going to be a specific point where we have concentration of the lymphocytes and macrophages. These lymphatic nodules are going to occasionally swell as they have more lymphocytes and macrophages attracted to them. And then when we're healthy, they tend to relax a little bit. They don't become as dense. But as we look at these lymphatic nodules, they are going to be present in high concentrations in lymph nodes, our tonsils, and yes, our appendix. Um, a common misnomer that's still in many high school biology textbooks is that the appendix is a vestigial organ. Um, a better definition for a vestigial organ is not one that does nothing. It's a, an organ that we haven't figured out what it does yet. So traditionally, the appendix was thought to do nothing for us. Now we know the appendix has lots of this immune tissue or lymphatic tissue in it and helps to aid with the immune response. When we look at our digestive tracts, we're going to have a lot of these lymphatic nodules in the small intestine, um, in the part of the small intestine that's right 
next to the large intestine. So when you think large intestine, most people will go, oh, that's where the poop is made, or the feces is made. So there's a high, a very high bacterial concentration within the colon or the large intestine. And the part of the small intestine that's right next to that, that's exposed to a lot of the bacteria, is the ileum. So to help monitor bacteria traveling backwards through the digestive tract, we'll have a lot of this lymph these lymphatic nodules in the last part of the small intestine. So let's pause for a moment and refer back to our notes. This is a fill in or a word question. So type in a word for your answer. What is the lymphatic vessel which drains most of the body? Or another way of thinking is which lymphatic duct drains most of the body? Which lymphatic duct drains most of our bodies? We have lymphatic capillaries that will merge to form lymphatic vessels. Those lymphatic vessels merge to form ducts. And of those ducts, which one is responsible for most drainage in our bodies? Make sure you submit an answer. We're done. Two, one. All right, time is up. Greg, apparently, is one of those lymphatic vessels. OK. Um, let's back up a couple slides here. We're, since we have answers that are kind of all over the place, The lymphatic duct or vessel that's responsible for draining most of the body is the right lymphatic duct that drains most of the body, the right lymphatic duct. Oh, excuse me, I'm reading the picture wrong. Sorry about that. When we look at this, it's right here on this portion, that is the thoracic duct that drains the majority of the body. Sorry, my bad. So as we look at our lymphatic organs, guys, gals, we have both primary and secondary lymphatic organs. The primary lymphatic organs are where we activate lymphocytes. Another word for activating or fully developing a lymphocyte is making them immunocompetent. And this is a term, term we'll refer to frequently. When we make something immunocompetent, um, it's fully developed, fully activated. It's able to recognize something that does not belong in our body and also recognize something that does belong in our bodies. So the tissues where we make our lymphocytes immunocompetent are going to be the primary lymphatic tissues or primary lymphatic organs. Those are the thymus and the red bone marrow. Thymus for the T cells, red bone marrow for the B cells. We also have a lot of secondary lymphatic organs. These secondary lymphatic organs will still have that connective tissue capsule associated with them, but we don't fully activate or mature our lymphocytes in these organs. Instead, mature lymphocytes will travel to these organs and hang out to monitor potential pathogens that may be in our bodies. So when we think of our lymph nodes, our tonsils, our spleen, um, one that didn't make it on this list but that's also considered a secondary lymphatic organ could be the appendix because of its incredibly high concentration of diffuse lymphatic tissues. If we focus on our red bone marrow, within the red bone marrow, we're going to have a lot of blood made, so hemopoiesis. And within that process, or that umbrella term of hemopoiesis, that we have both erythropoiesis and leukopoiesis. Erythropoiesis is making red blood cells. Leukopoiesis is making white blood cells. So as we're making the white blood cells, 
within our red bone marrow. That red bone marrow will be highly vascularized. There will be lots of blood capillaries associated with them. And as this red bone marrow um, has cells maturing in it, it, those cells of the immune system will eventually push their way into the blood capillaries. And as these cells of the immune system push their way into the blood capillaries, they will dump their leukocytes into the circulatory system. And then from the circulatory system, they'll circulate to the specific tissue they need to get to. So when we think of B lymphocytes, fully developed or immunocompetent B lymphocytes will drain directly into the blood capillaries and go into the bloodstream from the red bone marrow. And then when we think of those T lymphocytes, the immature T lymphocytes will be dumped into the bloodstream, travel to the thymus, and then in the thymus will finish their developmental process. They'll finish the process of becoming immunocompetent. So as we look at our thymus, it's kind of a jack of all trades. It's a, it's a multi-system organ that's involved in a lot of different things. It produces a lot of hormones, so we consider it a part of the endocrine system. It is going to have a lot of lymphatic cells in it. So we're going to consider it part of both the lymphatic and because it has the T cells in particular, it's also going to be considered part of the immune system as well. So our thymus does a lot for us. Now, as we look at the thymus, to find it in the human body, it's located um, where the trachea diverges to the left and right bronchi. We haven't gotten to the respiratory system yet. Um, so another way of thinking of where the thymus is located is the thymus is going to be located right in the center of our thoracic cavity, with, um, associated with the heart or next to the heart. Now, when we're first born, our immune systems haven't been exposed to a lot of antigens or pathogens within our lifetimes yet. We're fresh, we're brand new. And what we find is with the thymus of a newborn child, is the thymus of a newborn child is about the size of that child's heart. So relative to the size of the child, they have an enormous thymus. And they need that enormous thymus because they are working overtime trying to get their T lymphocytes um, fully activated, fully exposed, so they can stand alone with a functional immune system. As we age, though, our thymus becomes smaller and smaller and will shrivel up to become just a mass of fibrous connective tissues. Um, and when we look at a typical adult over the age of 60, it's almost impossible to thi find their thymus. Most of the cadaver studies I've done have just not had a thymus present because I've worked with very geriatric cadavers when I've dissected those. The term for that is involution or degeneration. So pragmatically speaking, one of the reasons why you see those health warnings for young children and for elderly individuals has to do with their thymus. For young children, their thymus hasn't yet had time to expose, to produce the T lymphocytes and expose the T lymphocytes to the specific pathogens. So they haven't had time to build up the immune, their immune system. And then with the elderly individuals, they have effectively a non-functional thymus or an almost not functional thymus. So they have a hard time responding to new pathogens that they hadn't been exposed to in a prior time of their lives. If we look at the histology of the thymus, our thymus is broken up into large regions. The dividing barrier of our thymus is going to be the trabeculae much like the trabeculae or fibrous extensions within our spongy bone tissue, these trabeculae are going to be extensions of the connective tissues that make up the outer capsule of our thymus. And as we look at these trabeculae, they will segment off regions of the functional tissue or the parenchyma of the thymus. These regions are known as the lobes of the thymus. And then within the lobes, we're going to have multiple tissue types associated with the outer circumference, the cortex, and then within the middle itself, the medulla. In terms of the signaling hormones or the molecules, um, I'm going to emphasize this. I don't want you to dedicate time 
to all of the different hormones associated with the thymus. Just know that the thymus makes hormones. We are done with the endocrine system, and there's enough to focus on with this immune system as is. So we have signaling hormones, thymosin, thymopoietin, and thymulin. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on those particular molecules. The interleukins and the interferons, though, we are going to spend more time focusing on those two. So focus on those two, the interleukins and interferons. And then for the other three, just know that they're hormones from the thymus. We also are going to have lymph nodes, and we need to focus on those in a little bit more detail. One of the key aspects of our lymph nodes is that they filter the lymph, they cleanse the lymph. They are going to help concentrate solid particulate that's in the lymph so that there's a convenient location to sample and monitor that solid particulate. If we think of a typical young adult, a typical young adult is going to have about 450-ish lymph nodes plus or minus 20 or 30. And you know, there's a lot of variation per individual. Another thing that we find is that body size is going to influence the number of lymph nodes. Larger individuals that have more tissue, I'm thinking of um, adipose tissue in their hyperdermis, so bariatric individuals will have more lymph nodes than individuals that are very tiny. And the same is true for physically larger people than compared to physically smaller. When we look at a classic lymph node, it's shaped, for lack of a better term, like a bean, a kidney bean. And that classic bean structure of our lymph node is going to have a hilum, which is a region that has some tubes exiting from the lymph node. And then on the outer circumference, or the wide arc of the lymph node, we have vessels that drain into it. Something that's worth emphasizing is that there are going to be more vessels draining into the lymph node than coming out of the lymph node. There are more afferent vessels than efferent vessels. And as we look at these afferent versus efferent vessels of the lymph nodes, it's going to cause the fluid to be concentrated within our lymph nodes. And because we drain, have more points of entry compared to points of exit, we're going to have a little bit about, for lack of a better term, a traffic jam. So if you live in the Twin Cities, you know where you have multiple interstates merging. A lot of times traffic will come to a standstill or slow down very dramatically when you have multiple highways draining cars into one location. The same is true of lymphatic fluid. If we drain a lot of lymphatic fluid into one location and then don't have as many exit points, that fluid tends to hit a bottleneck. And it'll hit the bottleneck in the lymph node where we have lots of particular fibers that will filter the fluid. So in addition to having the particular fibers filtering the pathogens out of our lymphatic fluid, the fluid mechanics of having more afferent than efferent vessels also causes that fluid flow rate to slow down, making it even easier to sample the fluid for pathogens. I remember when I was younger, thinking about breast cancer, which is the second biggest cancer killer for women in the United States. For both men and women, lung cancer is the number one um, killer. For men, the number two is prostate cancer. For women, the second biggest cancer killer is breast cancer. Um, and I always struggled with prostate cancer and breast cancer because you don't need your breast to stay alive, and you don't need a prostate gland to stay alive either. These are organs of the reproductive system. You may have trouble reproducing or nursing without these organs, but why on earth does a cancer of these tissues kill so many people in the United States? And the reason that cancers of these tissues is so dangerous is because of all of the lymph vessels, the lymphatic vessels that are present in these tissues. It's not the tumor in the breast or the prostate gland that kills the person. It's the fact that the tumor can spread rapidly throughout the body through the lymphatic system that's present in those tissues. So when we think of an individual that has breast cancer, if there's a radical mastectomy where the entire breast is removed, 
what the physician is doing or the clinician is doing is not only removing the tumor itself, but removing many of the lymphatic vessels that tumor would have been traveling through to metastasize or spread to the rest of the body. And it's not necessarily the tumor in the breast that kills the individual, it's that the rapid metastasis through the lymphatic system that kills the individual. So we have the radical mastectomy, that's going to be the removal of the entire breast and its lymphatic tissues. Um, it's been found though that radical mastectomies aren't always the best option. Um, back in the 1950s and 1960s, current medical theory just took a bigger is better approach. And well, if removing just a little bit, if removing just the adipose tissue wasn't enough, let's remove some of the underlying muscle. And the trend was to remove more and more and more tissue from the surface of the chest to help treat these breast cancer patients. But it's been found since then that we really only need to remove the tumor itself and then any affected lymph nodes. So common treatment now is to inject the patient, in particular the tumor of the patient, with radioactive dye. And then that, that radioactive dye will travel to the lymph nodes that are containing cancerous cells. And then the tumor itself and then the effective radioactive lymph nodes will be removed. That's the lumpectomy, which is nice in that there's less tissue damage and there's no needed reconstructive surgery or less needed reconstructive surgery afterwards. Um, it's worth emphasizing, just as while well, we're on the topic of this treatment, a common side effect of the mastectomy is going to be edema of the arm. So if you remove the left breast, you remove the left axillary lymph nodes, and now it's difficult to drain fluid from the left arm, and the left arm will oftentimes have excess extracellular fluid, it'll swell up. Edema of the arm associated with the breast is a common side effect of the mastectomy. Let's look at tonsils, one of our secondary lymphoid tissues. Uh, the tonsils are going to be present within the pharynx, which is a passageway that both food and air can travel through. And as we look at these tonsils, they are going to have lots of deep pits associated with them. These deep pits that are associated with our tonsils are going to have pathogens in, that are present in our food get trapped deep down in those cracks. And as those pathogens travel down into the cracks of our tonsils, they are going to be sampled by antigen presenting cells. So we have phagocytotically active cells present within the tonsil or crypts or the deep cracks in our tonsils, constantly monitoring pathogens that are entering our bodies. Um, depending on when the pediatrician was tra trained, sometimes they may say, yeah, we need to cut out those tonsils. A tonsillectomy is a go-to treatment. And then uh, after a while that fell out of favor and we thought, oh, hey, tonsils are secondary lymphatic tissues. We need tonsils to help bolster our immune system. Um, current theory right now is kind of uh, a compromise between the two approaches of always removing tonsils and never removing tonsils. Tonsils are gonna be typically removed now if they impede the ability to swallow or breathe. So if that patient is having their tonsils swell up, their tonsillitis is so bad and so chronic that it hurts their quality of life, then those tonsils are typically going to be removed. But we try to not cut something out of a patient's body unless we absolutely have to. As we look at our tonsils, there's three primary sets of tonsils in our bodies, the palatine, lingual, and pharyngeal tonsils, also known as the adenoids. As we look at the palatine tonsils, those are going to be associated with the palate or the top of our mouth, the post top and back of our mouth. When we think of lingual tonsils, lingual refers to language. The organ of language is the tongue. So lingual tonsils are associated with the back of our tongue. If you've ever taken your finger and shoved it into your mouth and kind of tried to feel it on the back of your throat, you could probably feel some big bumpy structures. The first ones you feel are a special kind of taste bud, but if you go really far back there, you could probably find your lingual tonsils, assuming you don't gag yourself first. 
And then we also are going to have the pharyngeal tonsils. Our pharyngeal tonsils are going to be up in the nasopharynx, or the superior margin of our pharynx. And these pharyngeal tonsils are frequently removed because as the pharyngeal tonsils swell, swell up, or as the adenoids swell up, they can impede airflow from the nasal cavity. Another secondary lymphoid organ is going to be our spleen. As we look at the spleen, guys, gals, it's another multi-organ system organ. We spent a lot of time talking about the spleen last unit because in our spleen, we recycled red blood cells. As those red blood cells or erythrocytes are destroyed, we need to remove the hemoglobin, and in particular, the iron within the hemoglobin to keep that free iron from circulating in our bodies. Um, within the spleen, the processing of the erythrocytes happens in the red tissue or the red pulp, which, you know, as its namesake implies, makes a lot of sense. The part of the spleen responsible for processing erythrocytes has a red coloration to it. The part of the spleen responsible for containing our white blood cells or our leukocytes is known as the white pulp. So those two primary tissues of the spleen are going to be associated with two separate organ systems. The red pulp is going to be associated with the cardiovascular system. The white pulp is primarily going to be associated with the immune system. Now, as you can imagine, because the spleen specializes in processing red blood cells and white blood cells, there are lots of blood vessels in the spleen. It's highly vascularized. And if somebody has a ruptured spleen, they can have massive internal bleeding. It's a big deal. Um, that should be taken very seriously. Just two years ago, one of my colleagues was at home with his kids. They were eating dinner, and his little girl was being, you know, a little three-year-old girl, kind of goofing around the table and fell off the chair and landed awkwardly on the floor and ruptured her spleen and then spent the next week and a half in intensive care just from falling off her chair at that perfectly awkward angle. It was a one in a million chance. So when we think of how many blood vessels are in the spleen, damage to the spleen needs to be taken very seriously because internal bleeding can cause you to have massive damage very, very quickly. As we look at the red pulp and white pulp, you can kind of see it up on the screen. The red pulp on your, like from the projector is gonna be kind of a pinkish color. The white pulp, from your perspective, is more of a purple or lavender color. So the spleen helps to process erythrocytes or white blood cells, fully or red blood cells, fully functional erythrocytes are going to go directly through the spleen. However, if that erythrocyte is showing signs of weakness, if it's damaged, if it's disrepaired, or if it has inappropriate antigens expressed on its cell membrane, that red blood cell is going to be flagged and destroyed while it's in the spleen. As we look at the white pulp, the white pulp is going to help to process antigens and pathogens. It serves in many respects as a giant filter that will allow for monocytes to monitor the antigens and be those monocytes can also be stored within the white pulp as well. So once we've activated our immune response, we have, for lack of a better term, a barracks or a battalion of reserve white blood cells stored in the spleen. Those monocytes that are stored in the spleen can be rapidly dumped into the bloodstream and then travel to the rest of the body to help phagocytize some pathogen that does not belong. And then finally, when we look at our spleen, it helps to stabilize blood volume. It's a reserve canister, a reserve reservoir or container that we store extra blood in. So when you go to maybe the Red Cross blood drive, you can donate a pint or two of blood and have no problem at all. Well, maybe a little bit of a problem. For the most part though, you're fine because your spleen stores extra blood that's immediately dumped back into your circulatory system so you still can maintain homeostasis. So let's pause for a point. I want you to draw a line, for the, uh, those of you who are following along paper, draw a big line. 
we're shifting gears right now. We're sh shifting from the lymphatic system to the immune system. So up until this point, we've been talking about tissues and organs. We're shifting gears now, and now we're going to start to focus primarily on cells and what those cells do in our immune system to help fight off disease. So when we say disease, usually in the context of our immune system, we're going to refer to a pathogen. When we say pathogen, it's anything, any organism that can cause a disease. So when we say agents, I want you to think any biological agent or any organism that can make a disease state. Another term that you'll hear for disease state is homeostatic imbalance. Any organism that can break homeostasis can be considered a pathogen. The most common are the bacteria and viruses. Human beings aren't necessarily going to be affected by that many fungi, thank goodness, unless we have some kind of immune system defect. We do a pretty good job of fighting off fungi. Um, a point of contention right now is going to be the molecular chemical or the molecular pathogens. Um, I'm thinking of a prion, for example. Is a pathogenic protein molecule technically an organism or is it not an organism? We don't necessarily have the time to die into prions or small segments of RNA and DNA acting as pathogens. We're going to focus on the big ones in this class because we're doing kind of a survey. So we're going to focus on the viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Now, as we look at our immune system, there's three broad categories of our immune system. We have the first line, second line, and third line of defense. Um, as we look at our first line of defense, this is the broadest, the most generalized, and will defend against the most pathogens. Our skin is fantastic at keeping pathogens out of our bodies. When we look at the stratified squamous epithelium that's keratinized, that's a membrane or a barrier that's constantly regenerating itself, constantly regrowing and pushing pathogens away from our body. Most microorganisms will never make it past our skin or mucous membranes. But let's say something does. We're in the, one of those rare situations where something can burrow rapidly through our skin or mucous membranes, or maybe you have a cut and they can bypass the skin or mucous membranes entirely because you have some kind of laceration. We then have the second line of defense. And the second line of defense is still going to be generalized, like the first line of defense. But it's an internal generalized defense. So the first line is general and external. The second line is general and internal. And these are going to involve some cells and some physiological changes. Um, the leukocytes, um, in particular natural killer cells, um, are very active in our second line of defense. Macrophages are another very active component of our second line of defense. And then when we think of some generalized response like inflammation or femur, these are fever, these are some physiological responses that will affect a lot of broad categories of pathogens. But let's say something makes it past the first line of defense, the second line of defense, and it's still causing problems. Usually at this point, we need to activate our third line of defense. The third line of defense is both internal and specific. So the first and second are generalized. The third is specific to the pathogen. And because our third line of defense is specific, it's sometimes referred to as adaptive immunity. It's constantly changing, constantly altering itself in response to the pathogens that make it into our bodies that are exposed to that third line of defense. And there's pros and cons to this. Usually, if our first two lines of defense can't defeat the pathogen, you're going to get sick. I mean, it's just not fun. But the benefit of getting sick, and there is, you know, a pro to getting sick. That benefit or pro is that your third line of defense is going to remember 
what it's been exposed to. So the next time you're exposed to that particular pathogen, you can respond very rapidly and hopefully not have the disease state. This is the immune memory function of the third line of defense. And this is the basis of getting a vaccine. So when we look at these general and specific defenses, the generalized defenses can all be grouped together and called innate defenses. When we're born, we have a nearly fully active innate immune system. Our adaptive immune system, though, isn't very powerful because when we're fresh out of the womb, we haven't been exposed to a lot of pathogens over the course of our lifetime because our lifetime has been a couple minutes long. So our adaptive immune system hasn't had time to adapt to the individual pathogens. Our innate immune system is up and running though. We have skin, we have mucous membranes, we're capable of having an inflammation or fever. So that innate immune system is going to be activated right away. Um, it's worth mentioning that there's some areas of research right now that are focusing on upregulating the innate immune system. There are some organisms in the United States, I'm thinking of saltwater crocodiles, for example, that have almost no adaptive immune system, but a very overactive innate immune system. And even though they live in cesspools, they almost never get infections and almost never get sick because of their innate immune system being so well developed. We as human beings take more of a balanced approach. We rely on the, both the innate and the adaptive immune systems nearly equally. Within our bodies, we're going to have those mucous membranes as well, some of our external barriers. And this can be kind of confusing for students. When we think of a mucous membrane, it's usually in our mouth, in our nose, our nasal cavity, inside of our digestive tract or our respiratory tract. But because it's exposed directly to the external environment, we can consider that an external barrier. Oh, were you going to tell me I skipped two slides? Sorry about that. All right, let's finish this slide. We'll finish mucous membranes and backtrack to skin. So as we look at our mucous membranes, there's a particular chemical compound that's present in our mucus called a lysozyme. And this lysozyme is going to cause bacterial cell walls to lyse. It's going to help to trigger the lysis or destruction of bacteria that are going to get in our mucous membranes. Another benefit of the mucous membrane is that it will physically trap pathogens. It's tough for a microorganism to move through mucus. Mucus is highly viscous and will physically impede the spread of that pathogen. The other external barrier that everyone thinks about because it's on the external surface of our bodies is the skin. We've already talked about how skin has that stratified squamous epithelium that's fully keratinized, so it's very tough. But something that's pretty cool about our skin is this feature called the acid mantle. And when we think of the acid mantle, you can think of it as kind of a patina or a thin coating on the surface of our skin that's both highly saline and highly acidic. And um, then this acid mantle is going to be made from our sweat and from our sebum. The sebum in particular is going to release fatty acids and then the sweat is going to release uric acids and other ionic compounds or other ionic salts. So when we look at the surface of our skin, it's dry, it's highly saline, and it's acidic as well. This is not a very favorable growth. Usually when we look at the microbes that can grow in the skin, um, they're going to be within the staphylococcus genus for those particular microbes or staph genus. And those microbes can thrive in those highly saline environments. But when we think of the microbes that affect the inside of our bodies, they have trouble thriving in that highly acidic, salty acid mantle. Within the sebum that's produced by our sebaceous glands, there are a broad range of different antimicrobial molecules and proteins that are produced. We have defensins, we have germicidin, we have some catholidins, all of these, and I'm, I'm not necessarily going to ask you about what the differences are between them. So for the purpose of the exam, I just want you to group these all together and think of them 
as antimicrobial proteins. We have a lot of antimicrobial proteins on the surface of our skin in addition to a bunch of salt and a bunch of acid. So in some respects, there is some truth that you can shower too much. There can be too much of a good thing. If somebody is showering three or four times a day with highly astringent soap, they are destroying their acid mantle and they're opening up their skin to make it easier for pathogens to grow on their skin. Most people don't shower three to four times a day with highly astringent soap, so they don't have to necessarily worry about out of control staph infections on their skin. Um, showering too little though is the other end of the spectrum. If you don't shower enough, you have too much organic matter build up on your skin and that organic matter can contribute to microbial growth. So there's kind of that happy medium of showering every day or every other day. That's usually pretty good for most people, depending on your individual preferences. So let's pop, oh wait, oh, oh, I did not mean to click that button. Start question, here we go. Please select all of the primary lymphatic organs. This is a multiple select option. Can you really only select one? Okay, pretend you can select multiples. This is participation based anyways. So we'll say select one of the primary lymphatic organs. All right, we are done. So earlier in this presentation, we talked about how the primary lymphatic organs are where our lymphocytes become immune, immunocompetent, where, they're, where they grow up and develop the ability to recognize pathogens and also recognize what does belong in our bodies. So for those two primary spots, they're the namesakes of the T cells and conveniently works out well for the B cells as well. They are the red bone marrow and the thymus. So let's see what we have here. We have a lot of red bone marrows. We have a lot of thymus. I intentionally threw the tonsils in there. Tonsils are a secondary lymphoid organ. Our lymphocytes do not become immunocompetent within the tonsils or our lymph nodes. Excuse me, the thyroid. Um, I threw this in there because a lot of students get thyroid and thymus mixed up with each other. The thymus is a gland of the immune system where our T cells become immunocompetent. The thyroid gland is up here in our neck as opposed to down here in our mediastinum cavity where the thymus is. So when you think thymus, think of a gland in the mediastinum. When you think thyroid, think up here by the larynx. Um, unfortunately, they're mixed up frequently with each other. Um, Pryor's patches we haven't gotten to yet, but they are the mucous membrane regions of the small intestines. Let's see how we're doing on time here. We have time for another slide or two. You know what, actually, this is a really good stopping point for the day. So I will let you go.